presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, he made history as the first Native American to be elected to a constitutional statewide office. And now former Idaho Attorney General Larry Echohawk is running the entire federal agency in charge of Indian Affairs. We'll learn more about his journey and his goals next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you tuning in on public radio and the World Wide Web. When he was just a young man, my guest today was in an accident that nearly cost him an eye. He regained his sight though, and ironically, the incident gave him a clearer vision of what he wanted his life to be. Today, Larry Echohawk, the son of a woman who had only an eighth grade education, is in charge of the federal agency that provides services to nearly two million American Indians and Alaskan Natives in more than 550 tribes. A member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma, Mr. Echohawk became Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in May 2009. In that position, he runs the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA, and the Bureau of Indian Education. Both are agencies of the Department of Interior. Now, many of you will remember Mr. Echohawk as Idaho's Attorney General from 1990 to 1994. When he won that election, he became the first Native American to hold a constitutional state office. He had already served two terms in the Idaho legislature and had also been the Bannock County prosecutor. Mr. Echohawk started his Idaho career as the chief legal counsel for the Shoshone Bannock tribes. In 1994, he ran on the Democratic ticket against Phil Batt for governor of Idaho and lost. For nearly 15 years after that, until his appointment as assistant secretary, he was a professor of law at Brigham Young University's law school. Mr. Echohawk is in our state to give the annual Sherman Bellwood Lecture at the University of Idaho and to participate in forums regarding Native American issues. And he joins me now to talk more about his career and his hopes for Indian country. Welcome. Thank you, Marcia. Good to be with you today. And welcome back to Idaho. Thank you. I know you have family here, but it's been quite a while since you've actually lived here. So. It feels good to be back in the home state. We'll talk a little bit later in the program about that transformative moment that I mentioned in my introduction. But first, I want to talk to you about your recent history, your swearing in. What was that like? After all, you at one point had thought you might not even go on to higher education, and here you were being sworn in as Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. Well, um, my life changed back on January 13th of, of 2009 when the presidential transition team called me at my law school office in Utah and uh, just invited me back to Washington, D.C. for an interview, and I had no idea what it would be, but it ended up being an offer to serve in President Obama's administration and to oversee Indian affairs for the United States. And we see footage here of that moment. What was that like for you, uh, that ceremony and that time? Well, it was something that I never dreamed would happen, and actually when they invited me to serve I hesitated even taking the job because the federal government has a pretty dismal record in terms of its treatment of native people so it took a while for me to say yes but I finally agreed to do it and uh, at that time you you gave a speech and let's listen to a little clip from that that we are in a historic moment it may not be here again. I don't know how long it's going to last, but things are lined up just right to do something special, something magical. And I am grateful to be a part of that. You can hear the emotion in your voice, obviously. Um, what did you mean by that? What, what are your hopes and dreams? What do you hope to accomplish in this job, and, and why do you feel it's a magical moment? Well, I think there's been some very dark chapters in American history. It's been a haunting history of mistreatment of Native people. But when I was asked to serve, it took me several days to be able to tell the President I would do it. But I did that because he made certain statements during his campaign about what his agenda was for Indian Country. And I knew that uh, then United States Senator Ken Salazar, the nominee for Interior Secretary, uh, had the same kind of vision for doing something that uh, would be different from past administrations. 
when President Obama talked about hope and change, those words reson resonated within my heart and soul, and I really thought uh, with the present composition of the Congress and President Obama and S Secretary Salazar that there would be some different things done, and I have not been disappointed in my first ten and a half months. In what areas? What areas were you, are you hoping for the most change? Well, uh, there are a lot of areas that we have responsibility for, but um, number one is education. We have the second largest federal school system in the United States. Uh, I oversee 183 uh, schools, K through 12, and then over 25 colleges and universities. And this is uh, very important to upgrade the quality of education because I believe very strongly that that's what will leave native, lead native people into a brighter future. And, you know, in general, it's just the execution of what we call the trust responsibility of the United States. The United States has made many promises, many of those in treaties, uh, that over the years uh, have not been lived up to. But I think this administration looks at things differently and a greater respect for the sovereignty of tribal nations and, and uh, being able to do all they can as a federal government to empower these tribes to succeed. You mentioned that you had to take time to think about taking this position. I mean, after all, as you write, your great-grandfather was forced off of his natal land. Your own father was forced into a boarding school, which is a shameful part of, of our American history. And um, you know, even after you were nominated, there were comments all over blogs and things like that that you're just going to be the voice of Washington. You're, it's still the image of oppression. Um, his job, I'm quoting now, is to maintain the status quo of the oppressor. So what, it, so, so what tipped the balance was your, your sense that President Obama had a different vision? Um, I hesitated because I knew that if I accepted this position, I would become the face of the federal government in Indian country, and that has not been a good thing in the past. But I believe that President Obama's administration will do some remarkable things. And uh, for instance, uh, I thought that I would probably come into office facing major budget cuts because of the downturn in the economy, but uh, in the first year the budget for Indian Affairs was a nine and a half percent increase and on top of that there was over seven hundred and fifty million dollars that came in in economic recovery funds which allows us to build schools, homes, um, empower tribal government, improve law enforcement and many other things in Indian country. And I know that President Obama has told all of his executive agencies that they must consult with Native Americans on issues rather than just the tribes finding out at the last moment that HHS or one agency is, is doing something. Um, now, s some in Indi Indian country, and, and this is no secret, we're a little worried about your appointment because you have expressed concerns about gaming in the past even when you were running for attorney general and attorney general in our state. Let's take a look at a clip from a debate that you did nearly 20 years ago in our studios here when you were running for attorney general on this issue. My record has been very clear. I've always been against gambling. In particular, I've been against tribal bingo. I worked as a tribal attorney at the same time that I served in the legislature. The tribe that I worked with supported very strongly the lottery. While I was in the legislature, I voted no. They were upset with me, but I held to my principles. You were opposed to gambling. Um, you belong to a faith, LDS faith, that generally opposes gambling. Um, and you really had to make some calls to tribes uh, when you were going through your appointment process to talk with them about this issue because as Attorney General you had supported a special session that made it tougher for Native uh, Americans to negotiate with the state on these type of issues. What, what changed or has something changed? Well, in my personal view, uh, you know, it's just how I conduct myself is I do not participate in gaming. Uh, you know, as a Native person, I have been able to see benefits that flow from gaming. It's allowed tribes to do things that they've never been able to do. Build schools, uh, you know, uh, be able to conduct foster care programs for children in need, uh, build health clinics, emergency services. It does a lot of good things. Um, I think that everybody knows there would be some downside to gaming for people that, you know, have some addiction to that. but. 
you know, on balance in Indian country, it has been an enormous economic, uh, uh, of, of enormous economic value. And so, But they were know, trying to tell you that at the time, too. I guess as Attorney General, you're in a different type of position, but... Um, well, I think that's a very technical legal argument, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of what position I was in, but it was a state policy issue uh, that was at stake. The voters of Idaho had been assured when they passed the lottery that it would not lead to any form of casino gaming, but the prior attorney general warned them that it would, and it was my responsibility when that, uh, when the court started to rule in a different way to signal to the governor and legislature that they would have to amend the constitution. It was not a, that particular issue was not something aimed at Indian tribes. And um, you mentioned the benefits that have accrued from, from tribal gaming. We know that money is coming back, actually in Idaho, comes back to the, the local school districts, and a lot of people are employed by the casinos. But we also saw the Abramoff scandal surrounding Indian gaming, really pretty shocking uh, thing. So there, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act, is it not? Well, uh, I think it, you know, is a delicate situation, but um, I've been in office as assistant secretary for ten and a half months and I've traveled all over Indian country and I've been on many Indian reservations where they have gaming operations and I think it's been an enlightening experience for me to see what tribal governments have done with gaming revenue uh, and you know it is a very positive thing that you see out there people are employed and you know they're generating money for educational scholarships and you know just taking care of the needs of the community and so you know, there's a there's definitely a plus side of it. There are some people concerned that tribes will buy res off reservation land and put casinos on it. And how do you feel about that? Well, it's a sensitive issue and one that the Obama administration is looking at very carefully. We have yet to announce the uh, gaming policy under this administration. I think that's something that's coming very near, but we haven't announced it yet. Do you have a concern about tribes needing to diversify past? gaming. I know some have, but many many are still really reliant on that income. Well, I think usually when a tribe has been without and they then are able to do gaming that they are pretty robust in pursuing gaming, but I think the, the prudent tribal leaders uh, quickly diversify with their gaming revenues. They go into other industries because they know it may not be an industry that lasts long term. Well, in fact, the tribes in Idaho are going to release a report soon uh, showing the economic impact of the tribes to the state. And I've seen uh, some draft copies of that, and it's quite substantial, not only in gaming revenues, but in, in other multiplier factors from jobs that they provide. Well, it's been very clear to me in the many communities that I've traveled in a, into across the country that have gaming, reservation gaming, that it is a uh, boost to the uh, local regional economy where these facilities are located. One of the things that the tribes have been able to do with some of the gaming receipts is start purchasing back land that came out of trust, I guess you might say, or used to be part of reservation lands but then was sold. And how important do you feel this is to start re regaining um, land that was once the tribes? Well, first of all, I think it's the moral thing to do to allow tribes to uh, regain ownership of lands that were once theirs because between 1887 and 1934 under the General Allotment Act passed by the Congress there was 90 million acres of land that were taken from native people and in 1934 the Federal Congress made it possible for tribes to retake lands uh, and I think this administration will be aggressive in trying to take lands into trust for native people. It is not only the moral thing to do, but uh, being able to acquire land allows tribes to generate economic development. And in many of the reservations, unemployment is very high. In fact, in some reservations, it exceeds 80 percent. Now, there's been a long-running lawsuit, Cobalt, right, lawsuit, over this issue of trust lands that the uh, allegations were that the Bureau did not sufficiently administer the revenues from those lands. We just saw some pictures of, of farming lands. There's oil and gas revenues that come off that land that's held in trust. And it's been settled. The lawsuit's been settled. And that, as I understand it, eventually every tribal member will receive at least $1,000 as a result of, this, of that settlement. For non-natives watching this, how important is this settlement and of course everybody's paying for it, all taxpayers are paying for it, it's in the 
billions of do dollars, right? Over $2 billion. Why is it important and why was it important that taxpayer money go to settle this lawsuit about these trust lands? Well, first of all, I need to say that this is an issue that I am recused from, so I have not been able to participate in the settlement negotiations, and until it's approved by Congress, I will not be able to be involved. You're and recused the reason for that is because of my your brother, brother. Yeah. was the uh, director of the Native American right. Rights Fund that was involved in initiating these lawsuits. Uh, and I think it, you know, I'll, I'll say this much because it's in the news, and I think it's what most people know that read the news, and that is it will be a $3.4 billion okay. settlement, which is enormous when you consider the total amount of claims that the Indian tribes of the United States have even ever been able to mount, you know, to uh, judgment in any courts in the United States. It is far beyond anything that the uh, tribes have ever been able to recover. But you know, even then it's criticized as being too low. So I think that, you know, there's uh, strong support for it, but there's some dissent among Native people about whether it is an appropriate settlement. And uh, it's up to the Congress now to approve it. Mm -hmm. They have to put the money behind the, the settlement. You mentioned your brother, John Echohawk, who's very well known in, in Native, Native American uh, circles for his advocacy. Some have been promoting him as a nominee for the Supreme Court position that's open. I think that'd be a great choice. Uh, I think that the American people probably don't know this, but there are nearly, I think, 900 federal judges in the United States and not one single Native American. And when you just stop, it just takes your breath away, you think, to think that Native American people have never had a federal there is not a federal court judge right now that is of native descent. And John Echohawk certainly is qualified to serve on the federal bench, and I believe personally on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the Echohawk name is, as I mentioned, well known not just John and you, but you have other siblings and now uh, children that are involved in issues. How, how did it come to be that the Echohawks were so involved in the civic life of this country? Well, you know, in, in past generations, uh, members of my, my family didn't go to college, and it was in my generation that we broke through. Of the six children born to my parents, all six of us were able to go to college, and three of us became lawyers. And I think it was just that we were in the right place at the right time in the civil rights era in the 1960s, and we had a mother with an eighth grade education that wanted us to succeed at education, and I think we were prepared to take advantage of the opportunity. I want to go back to the story that I mentioned in my introduction. You were injured as a child. You were a football player, mm -hmm. and, um, and you got hit in the eye. And it looked like you could lose your eyesight. And um, you decided to pray very hard about that. And uh, if you regained your eyesight, that you would read, in this instance, the Book of Mormon cover to cover. And from that point on, the faith has been a very important core central part of your being. Talk a little bit about that and that moment, what changed? Well, my faith is very important to me. I consider myself to be a spiritual person and I believe in the power of prayer. And that was a turning point in my life. Um, I learned some important lesson, lessons from that incident. You know, adversity breeds strength and I learned the value of bouncing back from some you know, devastating occurrence. and. I think that helped strengthen me for other challenges that I had in later years of life, but it gave me a confidence to overcome adversity and succeed at things. I'm sure you're having to draw on that right now. This must be an incredibly difficult job. You know, this is the, without doubt, and it's not even close, the most difficult uh, job that I've ever had. I have to work with 564 tribal nations. I have responsibility for managing 55 million acres of Indian lands. Um, you know, as the federal trustee, and uh, I manage a $2.6 billion budget, and I have 10,000 employees, and not to mention that school system that has over 47,000 students. And so uh, that's a huge responsibility that I think, you know, anyone would say the resources that are given to us to do the job are woefully inadequate. but. You know, we have a job to do, and we're just working as hard as we can to fulfill whatever responsibilities we have. And regarding your faith, I think there were some who were confused that a Native American 
is also LDS or a Mormon, do you see the two as complementary? Well, I think I've dealt with that challenge for a long time. I remember when I first ran for statewide office as Attorney General, I think it was the Idaho Statesman newspaper, had an article that said Larry Echohawk has no chance to win. He's got three strikes against him. He's a Mormon, Indian, Democrat. And I proved him wrong then, and so I've been able to deal with that. Going back to the issues uh, in tribal country, um, jurisdictional issues are very, very uh, important and sometimes very trying. And we saw in the legislature in Idaho this year, we had a jurisdictional issue regarding uh, police force, you know, who could pull non-natives over on the reservation. Um, and it's a complicated thing. It involves a, a public law called 280. But, but do you see these clashes, and there have been clashes up, up in, on the Nez Perce Reservation, as um, getting worse, ameliorating um, these jurisdictional issues, because it goes back to the reservations being checkerboarded, and a lot mm -hmm. of non-natives live on reservation land, but don't, don't see that as their government. Well, these are vexing and difficult issues. I recall from, you know, serving as a law professor and teaching federal Indian law, there's a United States Supreme Court case decided in 1886 where the justice that wrote the opinion called states the deadliest enemies of Indian tribes. And I think for a long time it was that way, but my experience here in Idaho has been that when we take time to carefully examine issues and we educate people of good faith about these difficult issues that they can be overcome. And I think that's what's made the difference in uh, I would say the last uh, you know, 25 years is that when we have difficult issues, it seems like nowadays we have the ability to sit down and dis discuss those things in a rational way and come to you know, a, a, an appropriate conclusion. And I hope that would continue to be the case here in the state. One of the areas where tribes and other governments sit down all the time is in natural resource management. Tribes have been actively involved in salmon issues, wolf management issues. Um, this has become a, a big part of what uh, tribal nations do. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts still on this ongoing salmon issue and the, and the dams here in Idaho. Well, there's the a, Lower Snake River. a lot of really tough issues to deal with, but Native people you know, have a very strong connection to the land and the animals and the plants. And you know, it's their physical surroundings. They care deeply about those things. And I know Idahoans do too, but uh, sometimes the strong feelings of Native people may clash with the economic realities of a state government, and that's when it becomes very difficult, and that's when people have to sit down and be rational and discuss things. And I think that uh, you know a lot of people are probably very thankful that, I, as I recall back in 1990 as an example, the Shoshone-Bannock uh, tribal leaders uh, petitioned to list the sockeye salmon as an endangered species. And of course that made things uncomfortable for certain segments of the economy. But I think we've learned to live with things like that and let the process work its way through. And I think that it's, you know, a right thing to do is to, to try to stand up for the things that you believe in. So, you know, right now we have the Nez Perce tribe that is not in favor of the biological opinion of the Obama administration regarding the dam. They want to see dam removal and then other tribes who've signed on to it, clearly showing there's a difference in, in, in the tribes. How do you feel? I mean, you, have, you were an advocate, a salmon advocate when you were here. Well, I think rational people can have some disagreements on what we ought to be doing to you know, resolve these difficult problems, but I always thought that the, you know, the salmon is a magnificent animal that is a part of Idaho's heritage, and you know, it's, a, it's something that's worth saving, and as Attorney General, I tried to do the very best I could to, to accomplish that, but at the same time, you know, do it in a way that would not be devastating to the economy of the state. So you, I hear you treading here. Uh, you, that's what you I think we have to do, you, you is to try to, you know, to have some balance, you mm -hmm. know, that occurs. So not necessarily taking down all the, uh, the dams, because that would affect you know, the that's, economy. That's an extreme option, but, you know, we may find one of these days is climate change, you know, brings on additional challenges that, you know, things can be different. Actually, the Department of Interior right now is involved in what they call the most, the second most important economic uh, restoration effort in the United States, 
other than the Everglades, and that's uh, on what they call the Lower Elwha River in Washington, where they will take out two dams, and that's to protect the, the uh, natural resources and the ecology of the land. Well, clearly we're going to see tribes continue to play a big role in these natural uh, resource issues. I want to ask you a little bit about Idaho before we conclude here. You did lose the governor's race to Governor Phil Batt. Um, we had a, a person write in. I asked for questions ahead of time, and somebody named Lisa wrote in on our Facebook page, actually, and said, is he going to run for governor? I was crushed when he didn't make it last time. Run again, Larry. <laughs> you know, in 1994, when I ran for governor, the day before the election, I remember Cecil Andrus, Governor Andrus, walked into my office, and he took, shook it stuck out his hand and we shook hands and he said, I want to congratulate you. He said, tomorrow you will be elected governor of the state. And I thought I was going to be because all the polls showed that, but in the people in Idaho saw it differently that year. It was the greatest year in 60 years for the Republicans nationwide. They captured the United States Senate, the House, and the majority of governorships. And, you know, Idaho's a strong Republican state and the tidal wave, I think, just, you know, overcame the Echo Hawk campaign, but I learned something about myself that evening as I gave my concession speech. You know, I, I thought I would have been extremely disappointed, but I was filled with peace that night. And I think that uh, I ran for the right reasons, and uh, you know, I, I used to campaign, and the best line I ever heard it made me feel warm inside is when people would tell me often, you don't seem like a politician. And I had a lot of people say, you're the only Democrat I ever voted for. So it made me feel good that I could draw votes across party lines by just trying to do what's right. But you know, there's life beyond political office. And uh, I went from Idaho to uh, Utah to serve as a law professor, and it's been a wonderful life. Uh, while I taught law school at Brigham Young University, two of my sons went through school there. I'd felt like I had kind of neglected my family during those years in office, but it allowed me time to kind of rebond with those two sons that are now practicing lawyers in Idaho. And I think that it just makes a father feel really good to see that his sons, you know, follow in his footsteps of the profession being a lawyer. And I've got a third son that's now practicing law with those two sons of mine and another son that's on the way to go to law school. So life goes on. and. Uh, of course, I never knew I'd end up being Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Well, now you are, and I'm sure those family bonds and all those experiences will help you in what I'm, I know is a very, very tough job. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and our viewers. You've been listening to Larry Echohawk. He is the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in the Department of Interior. I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of Dialogue. We hope you'll join us same time next week. Thank you very much. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.